My name is Mark McCollum. I'm playing host for today's Olenyak MNTL lunchtime webinar. Today we have Dr. Edmund Chow, who will be speaking on liftoff applications. He has some lovely examples of uh, excellent uh, photolithographic techniques uh, so that your liftoff edges don't uh, get tied up with one another. Ground rules are if you have any questions, um, we don't have your microphones live. So if you would type them into the chat section and press enter and they'll show up on a list and we'll try to cover all of those at the end of the talk. So today we have Dr. Edmund Chow, who has uh, about uh, 22 years working with electron beam lithography. And today he's going to speak with us about some resist profiles for liftoff. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark, for the introduction. Um, um, like the, I Mark just say, um, today I'm going to talk about how to engineer resist profile for lift off application. Uh, this for uh, both the E-beam resist as well as the uh, photolithography uh, photo resist. Um, I will first start with uh, telling you uh, what a lift off process is, and then I'll give um, two examples. Uh, one example is on uh, photolithography and to show you how to modify the resist profile uh, to make a better lift off and um, the exposure was done in our Heidelberg system. Um, the second example uh, will be uh, uh, doing the same thing but engineering uh, E-beam resist um, for E-beam lithography using our JOL um, EBL2. So what is a lift-off process? Lift-off process is a process that allows us to put down metal on a specific area on our sample that um, designed by the user. And typically the first step is done with the lithography. Um, shown here is the cross-sectional wheel. Um, the blue, blue color represents the photo resist. So using the lithography, it allows us to pattern the resist and um, to put the metal down, we open the window. Uh, so we, we, we develop a way to resist after the lithography step. And that area, uh, we want to put the metal down. And then we keep the resist uh, with the sample on those area where we don't want the metal to be, uh, to be on. So after the lithography step, after the develop, we do the metal deposition. Um, so the red layer here uh, is the metal. We put the whole sample into the evaporator or uh, sputtering tool or any other deposition tool. And um, we will coat the entire surface with metal. However, um, those area with the resist underneath, when we do the lift off, by doing lift off typically, it means that we put the entire sample into a solvent. And those softens are, are tailored to dissolve the resist that we put down. And for those areas uh, where the metal has photo resist underneath, um, it will get dissolved. And you can see the softens. As long as the metal is thinner than the resist layer, then you can, um, you can see that the solvent will have the access to the resist and therefore it can remove the resist as well as the metal. So after the lift off, uh, we hope to, what we hope to get is something like this. So those area that we open the window has the metal. Those area that we still have resist, all the metal will be gone. Um, however, if your metal layer is thicker than the resist, you can see that uh, even we have photo resist underneath, even we soak the entire sample in the, in, in the solvent, the solvent doesn't have the access to the resist and therefore the leaf off will not work when the metal thickness is thicker than the resist layer. So from, from, from this simple picture, um, your 
the user, the, uh, the only concern they may need to worry about is the relative thickness between the resist and the metal. So you may think that uh, as long as the metal thickness is thinner than, than, the, than the resist, then you should have no problem uh, doing your metal lift off. However, that is not the case. Um, shown here is an optical microscope image of a top view of one of the sample uh, that um, um, uh, shared with me uh, from uh, Warsaw's group's user. And the scale bar he is showing here is 100 micron. And in this step, in this picture, that was the result of trying to lift off only about 100 nanometer, 100 nanometer metal with a 575 nanometer photo resist after 24 hours with a lot of sonication. But you can see still a lot of residue. So to understand uh, and to troubleshoot this process, let's first look at um, how he obtained this uh, result. Um, he obtained this result by using a, uh, uh, one of the standard positive photo resist, AC1505. We measure the thickness with a refractance measurement about 575 nanometer. The exposure was done in Heidelberg uh, uh, tool that we have. And he has done many, many Heidelberg exposure. Uh, and but previously, after patterning, he used the photo resist as an etching mask. So that was the one of the first attempt that he tried to use the same exposure that he has been used for, for quite a while and successfully to pattern and then etch. But this is the first time he tried to do lift off. After he exposed the resist, he inspected it in the optical microscope after development. It looks just like before, looks pretty clean. And then uh, he put it in one of our EBM evaporator to put down uh, five nanometer titanium and 100 nanometer platinum. And then he put in uh, one of the standard uh, uh, solvent, PG remover or uh, NMP uh, at 60 degree for over 24 hour with sonication and still have a lot of residue. So, why do we have problem to lift up 100 nanometer metal when we have um, almost five times or six times uh, of the thickness of the resist? To understand that, we decided um, to um, do a test pattern on the same resist. So we, shown here is a top wheel, we exposed two parallel lines. So the line is pretty long, two millimeter and we leave a one micron gap here. So this is not drawn in scale. So this is one micron gap and we write two long parallel line using the same photo visits, using the same um, recipe, uh, dose time and development time. And then we deposit um, tie go, five nanometer tie and 15 nanometer go. But we don't do lift off, instead, we cleave along, the reason we took, we, we pattern two millimeter is it allow us to cleave across the, uh, the line and to look at the resist profile. We found metal lip off. So here is the profile. This is the silicon substrate. And we see about 580 nanometer AC1505. We see 50 nanometer metal here. And if we look at, from a side angle, now you probably can understand why the lift off doesn't work. It's because of this overcut profile. Overcut means the top opening is wider than the bottom. And yes, your metal, your, your resist is very thick. But when you do metal deposition, not only the top surface is going to be, going to be coated with metal, this side surface here will also be coated. When this happened, the solvent, once again, even though the resist is very thick, the solvent cannot have access to the resist. And therefore, it cannot dissolve the resist to do lift off. So the lesson we learned here is this kind of overcut profile is 
making will make the lift up very difficult. Now, what if we know this is a bad lift up profile? What is a good lift up profile? A good lift up profile looks like this. It has undercut. What what do I mean? Undercut means the top window is smaller than the bottom, and the amount of the undercut is defined as u here. Basically, is the difference between uh, the bottom window and the top window. With this undercut, when we do the metal metal deposition, we will have access to the resist, even if the side wall of the resist is still coated with metal as before. It's because of this undercut, uh, as long as your metal thickness is smaller than this uh, bottom layer, DL, then uh, the solvent can still, after the metal deposition, the solvent can still reach the photo resist and do the lift off. Shown here on the, on the right, is a actual uh, e beam resist uh, lift off uh, picture to show you the profile. Again, this is on silicon substrate. This is cutting across the line. Um, this T shaped thing is the e beam resist. And again, this is before lift off. You can see the metal here. You can see sort of the sidewall also coated with metal, but that's okay. We have a hundred or close to 200 nanometer uh, undercut. So after metallization, when you put in the solvent, the solvent has plenty of room to see those resists and therefore uh, the lift off uh, can be done easily. So um, just to remind you, um, as long the bottom layer has to be at least 30% thicker than the metal so that you still have room for the solvent to dissolve the resist. The undercut, doesn't mean the larger the undercut, the better. Especially for small gap, what, what do I mean? This is the gap we try to create. That's, this is the metal gap, right? We put down metal here, we put down metal here. We leave a gap uh, about 800 nanometer here. Same, uh, you can see here, right? We have metal on this side, metal on this side, and we hope to create this gap, uh, this length. So um, if your gap is large, then large undercut doesn't matter. But let's say you try to shrink the gap. You want to make the gap smaller. And if you maintain the same undercut or you make the undercut bigger, then your VC structure will collapse and it won't work. Therefore, if your, your design has small metal gap, it has, you have to be very careful to control the undercut. Because if you have too much undercut, this VC structure will collapse. And at the same time, um, you don't want to make the bottom layer too thick either. If you're, you, you should make it thicker, but not too thick. When it's too thick, again, you make this structure less stable. So especially if you have small gap, um, you want to just make, make this uh, bottom layer thick enough to do the lift up, but not too thick because it will cause the resist structure, the resist, uh, structure to uh, to fall and 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 ruin your lithography. Obviously, you don't want to make your undercut too small either. Let's say you want to you try to make the undercut very small. What happens is almost all deposition has some kind of angular distribution. Uh, so when you have angular distribution, if your undercut is too small, even you have undercut the metal sidewall can still code it all the way down and then you don't have access to your solvent. Um, for the angular distribution, I want to mention typically, uh, e-beam evaporation has a smaller angular distribution than sputtering. Uh, therefore, in general, it's easier to do lift off when you use e-beam evaporation. And that also means that if you are trying to lift off metal with done by sputtering deposition, you probably need a larger undercut um, to, to make sure this angle um, is big enough so that the angular distribution of your deposition is smaller. And then you have a open, uh, open access for the solvent. So um, now we know 
this kind of profile, this kind of undercut profile is a good profile for lift off. The next question is, how do we make this kind of undercut profile? Um, to show you that, let me first show you two cartoons uh, using uh, uh, positive photo resist and negative photo resist. Shown here, again, is the cross section. And both of them, we try to open a window in the middle. So we want to put down the metal in the middle for both of them. For positive resist, as you probably know, um, after exposure and develop, those get exposed will get developed away. Those resists that get exposed will get de developed away for positive resist. Therefore, to open the window in the middle, we will put the chrome on two sides and uh, have exposure in the middle. For negative resist though, as you probably know, um, those ex get exposed, the resist will get stay. And those, does, those negative resist doesn't get exposure will get developed away. Therefore, in order to create a window in the middle, we put the chrome here so that we have exposure on both sides to create um, uh, the window in the middle. Another thing I want to remind you is the dose distribution along the C direction. So in both cases, as you can imagine, um, the top surface will have slightly higher dose than the bottom because the scattering, the absorption, you can imagine that as we move down into the resist from the top surface, the dose will go down somewhat. This happened for both positive and negative resist. However, the consequence of this uh, C direction dose distribution is very different after you develop. So what do I mean? Uh, what I mean is for, for positive resist, stronger dose means faster develop. So that means because of this dose distribution along the C direction, uh, the positive resist, because it receives higher dose in the top, then the top opening is going to be bigger than the bottom. And therefore, you automatically get this uh, overcut profile, which is not good for lift off as we just uh, see in the previous slide. Now for the negative resist, we see the same dose distribution. However, as you know, a stronger dose means uh, uh, more resist get to stay for negative resist. And therefore, for negative resist, because of this dose variation along the C direction, you automatically get the top window to be smaller than the bottom. And therefore, you automatically get an undercut profile for negative resist. That is why in general, it's easier to get, uh, to do a lift off with negative resist because you, 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 you just uh, doesn't need to do any uh, engineering resist, doesn't need to an do any uh, special step. You ought, most likely you automatically get some kind of undercut. Now, um, we sometimes have to use uh, positive resist for lift off. For example, uh, in, in the previous case uh, that um, we already developed, we know that AC1505 very well. We already uh, uh, do the process development on that resist on the hydro world. So we know the exposure time, we know the dose and a lot of development time, a lot of time spent on it. So it will be uh, a time same thing if we can use positive resist for lift off. Another uh, reason for using positive resist for lithography is for scanning lithography, such as Heidelberg and electron beam lithography. Oftentimes, uh, 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 the flexibility of using positive resist for lift off is a must. Why is that? Let's say I want to pattern a metal course like this. This is a top wheel. I want to put down a metal like this. If I use positive resist because it's a scanning lithography, that means uh, I only need to scan the blue area, okay? If I try to create the same metal cause use negative resist, you can imagine I have to scan the green area, which is much bigger. And therefore, um, it's especially important to have a flexibility 
to create undercut profile for positive disease when we are doing scanning lithography, such as Heidelberg and electron beam lithography. So how do we create uh, an undercut profile for positive uh, photoresist? Um, one way to do it is using bilayer resist. We use the top layer as a imaging resist. So that will allow us to use the same process that we have developed uh, in, in patterning uh, 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 the same resist, use the same dose, same development time. The imaging resist is the resist that control the feature size. But we add a bottom layer and that layer the function is to help us to create the undercut and do lift off, and we call it lift off resist. In this example here, we are going to use SF6. SF6 is not Shofer has a four, I guess. It's just a uh, brand name, one of the PMGI product line from Microcam for lift off resist. So it just happened to call it SF6. Shown here is the step to create this bilayer. Uh, pauses. Highlighted in yellow is the new step. Okay. Highlighted in blue is the original step. So basically, we are keeping the same spin speed uh, for the imaging resist AC1505, same exposure parameter, same development. All we did is uh, we first spin the bottom layer, the lift off resist. Okay, uh, this spin at 5K by at 200 degrees C and we measure it about 300 nanometer. And then we spin the uh, imaging resist that will control the feature size that we want to divide, expose it the same way, develop the same way. But before we develop the bottom layer, we did an extra step uh, to postpone the AC1505. Uh, we put it on hot pay 110 degree. This is because the developer that we use for SF6 is also a base developer, is a TMAH base developer. If we, if we don't do this post-bake step, uh, when we develop the SF6, it will also develop the AC1505. That means it will distort the feature size that um, we want to pattern. By doing this step, which was suggested by uh, Karthik uh, one of uh, our new uh, lithography engineer, you allow us to uh, basically stop the further development of the AC1505 when we try to develop the SF6. And we look at the feature size um, after the uh, CD26 development, uh, it's pretty much the same. So by doing these three extra steps, our new resist profile shown here. Okay, this is still the silicon. This is our AC1505. You still see the overcut profile, but because of the SF6, because we can control this development time, you allow us to create an undercut. And with this new undercut profile, we put down the metal and we do the lift off. On the left is a picture I showed you before using just AC1505 with the overcut resist profile, we put the sample in solvent for 24 hours, a lot of residue. Now we added three steps with the SF6, the lift up resist. We only need 15 minutes, still in the same solvent, PG remover, no sonication. You can see that the whole metal film come out in 15 minutes. And you can see the feature that we try to define here, the sample. No sonication means no tearing the film. That means the roughness of the edge will be uh, smoother. And if we look at the SCM uh, on the fine feature here, again, you see no residue. Um, so this is a huge improvement. This is one of the first few attempts we try to uh, just by changing the resist profile to see how we can improve the lift off. Obviously there are uh, further optimization one can do to make it even better. Like say, uh, the thicker lift of resist uh, will cause the resist structure to be unstable. So since we only have 100 nanometer uh, 
metal that we need to put down, we can use a thinner lethal resist. We don't need 300 nanometer. Uh, the reason we use 300 nanometers is because we don't have thinner uh, lethal resist. Um, we can also control the undercut better by controlling the um, development time, by controlling the baking temperature. Using a smaller undercut will allow us to create a smaller gap. And finally, um, um, SF6 have a uh, custom developer, PMGI 101, which is supposed to not develop AC1505. If we have this one, then we can actually skip the post-bake, uh, eliminate the post-bake part step, and uh, completely eliminate the possibility that will distort the uh, imaging resist by, uh, by doing the extra baking step. So um, that is what I want to show you is by changing resist profile, by tracking it, it can make a huge improvement. Now let's move on to the uh, E-beam lithography. Um, as I just mentioned, right, a scanning lithography require the flexibility uh, that we can create a uh, 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 lift of pulses for positive resist. And one of the classic workhorse E-beam resist is PMMA. Uh, I guess some of you have used it and some of you have heard about it. To create a uh, undercut profile for PMMA is actually fairly, fairly easy because PMMA is a polymer and you have different molecular weight. And two standard molecular weights that you can buy off the shelf is the 495,000 and 950,000 uh, standard. You can custom uh, uh, purchase uh, different molecular weight, but those are the most standard one. Um, if you attend my previous webinar, you probably, uh, you probably, uh, have seen this before. So like I say, PMMA is a polymer. And um, 495K means the polymer length is shorter than 950K, about half of it. And as I mentioned in my previous webinar, um, the E-beam exposure will cause depolymerization. Um, and what the depolymerization means is just cut the uh, polymer chain into a shorter fragment. And after it cut into a shorter fragment, it will, it will increase the solubility when we do the development process so that uh, you can develop the feature that you want to pattern. And as you can expect, if you start with a longer chain of the polymer, you will require higher dose, more E-beam charge, to cut into a short enough fragment for it to develop in the, uh, in the development step. And therefore, you expect uh, 950K will be less sensitive than 495K polymer. And as I mentioned in my previous webinar, uh, one of the best way to check the sensitivity is to measure the contrast curve. So shown here is the contrast curve for two polymer, uh, two PMMA, 950, uh, 495K, the red curve, and 950K, the blue curve. And they develop in the same development process, MIBK, IPA one to two for two minutes. And because of the sensitivity difference, you can see that um, I plot here the normalized step height as a function of dose. The, the step height is normalized to the initial thickness of the PMMA. So it go to one uh, when it's fully developed. And you can uh, clearly see that um, the 950K critical dose is higher than the 495K. And you, you get a differential in terms of the sensitivity, even you develop in the same developer. At the same time, the contrast is also higher for 950K than the 495K. Again, that's expected because the unexposed area, the longer chain obvious, obviously have a lower solubility and therefore you get a higher contrast. So because of this sensitivity difference that we can easily uh, purchase 
two different molecules where PMMA, it gives us a good candidate uh, for the, um, for using 950K as the imaging resist and 495K as the lift up resist. So that's what we do here. So we use the 495K that is more sensitive, develop faster as a lift up resist. And we use the 950K, um, the higher contrast one, the less sensitive one as a top layer as a imaging resist. And that will allow us to create a, a PMMA uh, uh, we see structure looks like this because the bottom layer has high sensitivity. So even though we develop together, it's going to have a wider opening on the bottom and create a smaller resist uh, width at the bottom and a wider resist width on the top. And therefore, when we put down 200 nanometer go here, even though the metal does go to the side because of this undercut, Again, the solvent can go in and do the lift off. You may think that a single development of uh, 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 both the lift off resist and the imaging resist may seem to be convenient. However, by doing that, we actually lose the control. We lose the independent control of the feature size and undercut size. What do I mean? If you customize the feature size by optimize the dose um, and, uh, and the development time, then your undercut size come with, come with it. You cannot change it. When you try to make small gap, look at this gap is about 300 nanometer. Imagine if you want to create a, a, a gap, a metal gap that is 100 nanometer. You need to you need the capability to control the undercut size and the feature size independently. And that's the motivation for developing a new process that will allow us to have independent control of feature size and undercut size. Another motivation for developing a new process is the fact that PMMA is actually uh, much less sensitive than the SAP. And that is part of the reason why SAP is quite expensive. Um, to characterize how much more sensitive SAP compared to PMMA, again, the obvious uh, measurement one can do is uh, measure the contrast curve. So shown here is the normalized step height as a function of those for three different resists. Um, the blue is still the 950K PMMA, the red is still the 495K PMMA, the black is a SAP. And you can clearly see that the critical dose of SAP is about one third of the 950K. And the contrast is slightly higher. One can try to improve the contrast of the PMMA by using cold development or high contrast developer. However, that will further push the contrast curve to the right, that means higher critical dose, that means slower. So it will be nice to be able to use SAP as a uh, imaging resist. However, if we use SAP as an imaging resist, we can't use 495K as a lift up resist because the bottom layer needs to be more sensitive. It needs to develop faster. So what can we do? Uh, one way to do it is to use SAP as a imaging resist and SF6 as our lift off resist. It will, it will be able to speed up the writing process at the same time, give us independent control of the feature size and undercut size. What do I mean? So that is the, our resist stack. Uh, the top layer is the imaging resist. The bottom layer is the SF6, uh, the lift off resist. SAP is developed in a solvent-based developer, CDM50. SF6 is developed in a base developer. And the nice thing about that is they don't interfere. It means that the solvent-based developer that we use to develop SAP doesn't affect SF6 at all. And the base developer that we use to develop SF6 doesn't affect the SAP at all. So with this completely independent developer, yeah, allow us to control the feature size and undercut size uh, independently. And because the two developer is completely independent, no post spec is needed. So we don't need to 
uh, uh, worry about the possibility the baking step will distort the, uh, uh, the imaging resist pattern. At the same time, we speed up the writing time by a factor of three. So some of the um, IDT electro repattern for acoustic wave application used to take 15 hours with the bilayer PMMA, now take uh, less than five hours. So that's a uh, huge improvement. And shown here is the resist uh, uh, SCM picture, the cross section. You can see the top layer is the SAP and the bottom layer is the PMMA. We create a, a, a smaller undercut that will allow us to create a smaller gap. Uh, showing on the right hand side uh, is a uh, tilt angle. You can still see the undercut here. Those are the IDT electro finger. Uh, that's before metal deposition. After metal deposition, you can see the metal layer here and you can see the metal layer on the top and you can see there are plenty of room for the solvent to get in. And this one is looking at the same angle. You can see the bottom electro here that is attached to the sample surface and the top aluminum uh, on top of the resist, it coated part of the side, but that's no problem. Uh, we have plenty of space of the undercut allow us to, to do a lift off uh, 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 without sonication and much smoother edge. So um, in summary, um, I show you the importance of resist profile that we need to look at uh, when we do lift off, especially for positive resist. And um, if you have the choice, negative resist in general is better for doing lift off. And I show you um, for scanning lithography and for some other uh, 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 situation, one can also create undercut profile using bilayer resist for positive resist. And finally, I show you an example um, using a completely incompatible developer for the imaging resist and lift off resist will allow us to give independent control of the feature size and undercut size. So um, I will stop here for the question. And I also want to advertise uh, our next webinar is next Tuesday uh, about dry etching at the same time. And um, I will stop for the questions. Thank you, Edmund. I have a question about uh, the photoresist. Um, early on, there was a question about uh, how thick the PR should be compared to the metal layer, but I think you've gone into that extensively. That was the detail of your talk. Can you comment on the difficulty in controlling the thicknesses of these resists? Um. In general, I mean, there are different resists tailored to different thickness and uh, by, I mean, typical resist manufacturer give you a spin curve. So different spin speed correspond to different uh, thickness. And I mean, the spin curve give you a range of the thickness that you can uh, do by just changing the spin speed. But if you require a very different range of the thickness, then you might need to change to different thing, uh, different, uh, different product line, just like SF6. And uh, for example, I show uh, there's a, uh, for example, the lift up is this. This is a uh, PMGI uh, product line. They have SF series, LOR series. So uh, for example, if you want the thickness uh, less than 100 nanometer, you will choose this two product line. And if you want thicker, you probably use this. So. Uh, most of the photo resist will provide a range of the uh, product line allow you to uh, 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 specify uh, what thickness you want. And then uh, with the spin curve, uh, you can within one product line, you can tune it, uh, for example, for the blue one, SF5, you can tune it from one point, uh, 150 nanometer to uh, 300 nanometer, so. Can SF6 be used for both photolithography and e-beam lithography? Yes, yes. Uh, SF6 uh, is sensitive to, uh, um, so PMGI based uh, 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 um, uh, resist 
are sensitive to the wavelength, uh, the deep UV wavelength as well as e beam resist. And uh, so it can be used for both uh, e beam exposure and uh, photolithography. And that's what I show in, in, in my slide that uh, one exposure was done with Heidelberg, which is using UV. And then the other one, when we're using SAP, uh, combined with uh, SF6, that then we use it uh, in the e beam exposure. Are there other photoresist products that are cross compatible like this? Uh, from what I talked to the Michael Cam, um, if we purchase the PMGI 101 developer, it's supposed to be compatible. Uh, with the AC resist, meaning that the PMGI 101 will not uh, develop the uh, AC 101, uh, uh, AC 1505 uh, photo But I mean, to check that, you you still need to talk to the specific vendor and do your do your research. I mean, there are so many different kind of resists, but I'm pretty sure that you can find some kind of resist stack that give you a complete control. Uh, to control your feature size and, uh, and, and your undercut size. Question about contrast curves. Can you comment on the electron energy that you used and what electron energies would be appropriate for contrast curves? Uh, in, in general, I mean, Different electron energy will give you a different contrast curve, as I mentioned in the previous webinar. Um, all this was done at 50 kV. Uh, if you are using higher kV, uh, all the critical dose will, will move up, just because when you have higher kV, um, the high energy electron will penetrate through the resist um, much deeper and therefore uh, the percentage of the electron that get to interact with the resist will be less. And in general, higher KV will also give you a, uh, a higher contrast just because of the point spec function. Um, so um, different KV, uh, you, you can measure contrast curve for all, the, all, all, all KV system, but obviously for E beam exposure, you want to measure the contrast curve at the accelerating voltage, you are going to do the E-beam. So, um, and, and uh, that's what you should do. I mean, you should use the uh, E-beam, uh, you should use the accelerating voltage that you use for the actual exposure because that is the relevant, uh, that is the relevant contrast curve that you want. Uh, I mean, same as, uh, same as uh, 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 optical exposure, you want to use the same wavelength uh, uh, to measure uh, your conscious curve for optical lithography, so. So would it be all right for me to say that developing and characterizing your process using a contrast curve is your way of comparing one process to another and writing your contrast curve can be done with any level of exposure and any photoresist. Yes, yes, especially with direct right like Heidelberg, it's really easy to measure a contrast curve because direct right uh, scanning lithography allow you to in one exposure uh, changing the dose. So if you are if you are trying to do it in on a liner, then you have to do multiple exposure to get uh, different dose. Uh, so. Uh, that will be uh, much more time consuming. But you could use, if your uh, uh, aligner has the same wavelength as, as your Heidelberg, then you could use the Heidelberg uh, to measure the contrast curve for your resist and development pulses. And most likely, if the wavelength is the same, uh, 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 the contrast curve will be, uh, will be uh, relevant. Thank you. I think that's all I have for questions, uh, except for there are people already looking for recordings. So at this point, the recordings are not widely posted, so they are being held on Zoom. If you will send me, uh, or for these talk, this particular talk, Edmund, 
uh, request, we'll be glad to forward you the link and the password you need to be able to view the recording. And as always, if you need help from any of the engineers or specifically with uh, the imaging that Edmund has done the last two weeks, you can contact him directly. We're here to help people with process challenges and development or if you're doing something new, uh, it might save you a great deal of time of asking. We might have something that we can um, help you get to your process needs more quickly than redeveloping things. Uh, otherwise, I think we're done. Um, hang on, let me read a couple more things that just came in. Uh, is there a way to reduce the amount of metal that hangs over edges or to do any engineering on your edge effects on these types of liftoff processes? I mean, the, the edge uh, deposition uh, most likely have to do with your deposition, angular distribution. Um, if you have, um, let me, uh, yeah, so the amount of metal that go onto your edge uh, most likely uh, is depend on your angular distribution of your deposition. For E-beam evaporation, if, if you have a um, sample that is very far away from your target, then you almost always get normal incident. Then your sidewall coverage will be less. But uh, for those, I think it's more I mean, to control how much metal get deposited on the sidewall is more for a deposition uh, step. I mean, the lithography just changed the resist profile so that it 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 can uh, it can uh, it can do the lift off with an angular distribution with the sidewall coverage. So to reduce the sidewall coverage, you have to reduce the angular distribution of your deposition. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, before you end, did you answer the question about uh, constant or for contrast curves? Uh, what is the question? Uh, Zhao asked, uh, "What what is the electron energy needed for the contrast curves that you're providing?" The, the, the contrast curve depends on the accelerating energy. So um, you want to use the same energy as your E-beam exposure uh, to do your, con so the contrast, different accelerating voltage will have a different contrast curve. But the relevant contrast curve you want to measure is the one that you are going to use the exposure. So. Um, if you are doing 50 kV, you measure the contrast curve at 50 kV. I mean, contrast curve is not just a characteristic of the resist. It is the characteristic of your entire process from, uh, from your resist, from your uh, developing process, developing time, and so, and accelerating voltage definitely depends on it. And in my previous webinar, I explicitly mentioned that uh, 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 higher KB is going to shift the contrast curve to the right uh, and by a lot too. So uh, the question is not, the question is not what accelerating voltage that you should use for measuring the contrast curve. Uh, the question is what uh, accelerating voltage you use for your lithography step, then you should use the uh, same as everything voltage to measure the contrast curve and to, to, for you to characterize the sensitivity of your pulses. We recorded the previous talk. If you haven't seen it, I think uh, part of that would be a, a very detailed explanation about the contrast curve use. Uh, right. Edmund, could you go back to slide six? Yes. So that T-shaped E-beam resist you have it labeled yes. seems to be 
on the left, uh, you have a straight line drawn, but the resist seems to have sagged on the edges. Can you comment on uh, what can be done to change that if it can be and how one try can control uh, the, the edge sagging? Um, I mean, the edge sagging uh, can, I mean, can be due to many things, including the metal thickness. So, um, and also when you do the cleave, um, to cleave your sample. So let's say uh, uh, we can look at the resist without the metal. Um, and the resist, the T-shape uh, will, will, the resist also has its, uh, has its weight, has its mass. So that's why I, I mean, if you don't need that thick top layer, you don't want to have, make it too thick. I mean, it will cause it to bend, but I don't know how much the bending is due to the resist itself and how much is due to the cleaving. And obviously when you cleave, there's a lot of stress putting on it. You try to uh, make it less, as, less as, as little invasive to your resist that you try to look at as possible. But you can imagine when you cleave it, uh, it will distort somewhat. Um, so um, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure uh, uh, how much is the actual uh, resist sucking uh, is actually happening. So it might appear to be uh, more so than, than it is. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, hope to see you uh, next week. All right, thank you very much.